this should happen. Good evening. Today is Thursday, June 22nd, 2017. The time is 6.30 p.m. and the regular meeting of the Greensburg Redevelopment Commission is now called to order. At this time, if everyone would please silence their electronic devices. And if everybody would stand, we'll begin our meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. To comply with Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the City requests that participants in this meeting complete a voluntary anonymous survey that is available on the table in the back of the room. First item is roll call. Shannon, would you mind conducting a roll call, please? Dave Weigel. Present. Adam Wetzel. Present. Ken Dornich. Present. Fayetta McKenzie. Jody Kaufman. Shannon McLeod. Present. Thank you. First item of business on the agenda is to approve the minutes of last month's meeting, May 18th meeting. Are there any corrections to the minutes as presented? If there are not any corrections to the minutes, they then stand approved as presented. Item two, update of project status for phase two. Mr. May, do you have a report for us? I do, thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Um, we're not seeing a lot of accomplishment, but we're seeing progress. Um, we held our public hearing about three weeks ago and had no public commenters at the meeting. Uh, after the, that public hearing, there was a two-week period for written comments. We did receive two comments. One was from a property owner, and the subject of their comments was related to the right-of-way acquisition process. And our consultant responded accordingly to that comment that it will be dealt with during the right-of-way acquisition phase. The other comment, interestingly enough, was from the in, INDOT um, environmental group. And um, our uh, consultant has responded in the final document to their comments. Um, and I believe they also had a conversation with Federal Highway about those particular comments. And it's believed that Federal Highway doesn't see anything from that. Quite frankly, it was kind of an unusual situation that I have never seen before. So, um, the finding of no significant impact has been drafted and will be submitted tomorrow to NDOT. At some point, it will be forwarded to Federal Highway, and it is anticipated that within 45 days, we will have um, concluded the environmental process with execution by Federal Highway and NDOT of the finding of no significant impact. So that would be roughly the middle of August. I think we probably slipped a couple of weeks from what we had been striving for, but, but I think we're heading forward and I think we're going to be where we need to go. So once that is concluded, then we will be ready to commence the right-of-way acquisition process, which will initially be uh, having the appraisers View the properties and appraise the needed pieces of rights of way. And when they are done, that will come back to us with their uh, appraised values. They will do an appraisal and they will do a review appraisal. There's two different people that work in this process. One does it, the other reviews it to make sure everything's by the rules. And then um, once we have approved the appraised values, which we have very limited discretion about. Um, they will be sent to the owners um, and the owners will be given a period of time in which to respond, either accepting or denying, making counter offer, whatever they care to do. So hopefully we're ready to move forward to that stage. Once the environmental process is concluded, it's pretty much a downhill trip from there. Um, the only other issue is, is right of way and, and how agreeable or not the various property owners are going to be. So that's, 
could be a little bit of time, but we'll end up where we need to be when it's all over. Um, any questions about phase two? This probably isn't exactly phase two, but it's not on your agenda. Um, you all have been funding some consulting services for an overlay district for Veterans Way Memorial Way corridor. The uh, steering committee, as you remember, this had gone to the plan commission back in March. The plan commission handed it back to the steering committee and directed the steering committee to meet with the property owners, which the steering committee did. Um, we met with the property owners on three different occasions and um, revised, extensively revised the draft ordinance. And one of the major changes was to reduce the area a great deal. Um, that went back to the Planning Commission for a second public hearing Tuesday of this week. There were, again, several comments, particularly from the property owners involved, and the Planning Commission advanced the ordinance to the Common Council with negative recommendation. That's not unfavorable, unfavorable recommendation. So um, Council can do whatever, but I don't think the probability of that occurring is very bright. Ron, can I ask you, you mentioned that you had done extensive revisions to the property owner's concerns. <clears throat> Did they acknowledge those revisions? There were three meetings held. They lasted two, two and a half hours each. Uh, the very first meeting, we simply went through the entire original draft of the ordinance and itemized every concern that anyone had, any of the property owners had that attended that first meeting. The second and third meeting involved, well, in each of those two meetings, we went through about half of the ordinance, about half of the concerns, and dealt with each one of those specifically. And I thought, as a group, we had found some acceptable middle common ground. Adam, you were some of those meetings, I don't remember if it was all, but do you think we? Well, we absolutely, we started out with a very large, I was looking for the drawing, a very large uh, swatch of, of property on north and south of, of the uh, highway there what we wanted to cover. And we came down on it pretty fast and then came down again and then came down again where it's only 300 feet. So the, the end proposal was only 300 feet from the center of the road, you would have to abide by the overlay. So if you're next to the interstate, you wouldn't have to do any anything in the overlay. If you build a building outside the 300 feet, you'd stay with the current ordinance. So I think we've been on just about every single area in there, and the mayor's in there too. I think every single area, the mayor, Bent and gave up everything that was possible with keeping the minimum intact to try to make it at least a matching area to try to match that as our front doorstep to our community and match not only that but the nine other projects we have going on to match lighting everything else match Lincoln Street to make it look like a uniform city so it was uh, a little disappointing that uh, um, that it didn't go through considering that uh, there wasn't I felt like with what was given up, there wasn't a whole lot left. It wasn't just some basic, basic. Adam is Adam's recollection of this process matches my recollection nearly perfectly. However, at the public hearing before the planning commission, there were assertions that property owners weren't given full involvement in this process, and that changes were made that they weren't aware of until they came out before the public largest concern seemed to be that there was a few residents in the residential area itself that felt that um, there was something that was going to change for them residentially to comply with something with the overlay, which specifically they are completely taken out of anything with the overlay. There's, there's nothing that they would have had to do unless, I guess one scenario would have been, the only scenario is if they sold their property to someone, that person 
came and, and appealed and got their zoning change of their residential land and they turned into commercial at that point they would they would have to with the overlay which is common sense of what it is when you change anything in zoning. so you have to a, a little that. history about that aspect for the first hearing those property owners on the south side of county road 150 north that's what we're talking about they weren't notified because the first two or three renditions of the area never included that uh, R2 property, one or two family residential property. When we went to the 300 foot wide strip for administrative purposes, it was cleaner to just say 300 foot either side from State Road 3 to uh, North Michigan Avenue. And then the proposable proposal specifically exempted one and two family residential from any of the requirements of the ordinance. So while technically they would have been in the area, as long as they stayed residential, they would never have any obligation relative to that ordinance that would have been adopted. So because they then were in the district in the area for the second hearing, they were notified. And so they were a little confused about that part of it. I think that's what cut them off guard. We went from literally labeling parcels for Memorial Way and Overlay. It was about the parcels and what the parcels had to do to changing it down so much, shrinking it, that it became an issue that we shrunk it so much that now we're talking about feet instead of parcels and acreage. And so at that point, the swap was all the way down made, made it perfect sense. And to add just a little bit more about the 300 foot, the right of way for Veterans Way and Memorial Way is a minimum of 100 feet wide or 50 foot either side of the center line. So the ordinance would cover 250 foot at the max. Yes, for whatever my opinion is right. The city has expended a lot of money on this project, more than more than any other entity involved in it. <clears throat> and I think it's short-sighted not to have some kind of an overlay program. Without that, we leave the door wide open to literally any kind of development out there. You know, and I, I, I drive around a lot, I've been around the state a lot, uh, I've been in EDC, etc. You look at some of these other towns that have uh, nicely developed uh, parks, industrial parks, and it's obvious that they've got a plan in place, uh, which is basically what we're talking about, in a very, very minimal plan at that. I think it's just extremely short-sighted, not to have, and as I said, what am I, whatever my opinion is, but I think it's extremely short-sighted not to have some minimum type of plan involved. Um, we just open the door to all kind of haphazard development. And we've seen that in town. We've seen that on that side of town within the past couple, couple of years. It, it, uh, when you and I talked about it the other day, it greatly upset me to think that there's not enough foresight involved to see what our town can be. If we don't, if we don't ever change what we've done before, we're never going to change. And no, we don't want to be a Carmel. We don't want to be any of that. We want to be Greensburg. We want to make our town look better. We want to make our town more appealing. Uh, I mean, I could get on my soapbox here, but you know, we want to bring industry to town. We want to bring people and families to town. It, it doesn't happen unless we do something to make it happen. To to sweeten the environment so it happens. Ken, to add a little to what you just said, when I am involved in conversations with people about what does it take to get people to move to Greensburg, one of the very common messages is we need amenities in the community that people desire today and that will attract people to move here. And I believe those amenities can be well, they're quality of life, and they can be um, premier shopping opportunities. Now, we're not going to have um, 
keystone of the crossing in Greensburg because we're not big enough. But we can still have neighborhood or neighborhoods that are just a little bit nicer than what we've had in the past. And this is a way, I believe, to accomplish that. Comment was made to me that we're kind of chasing our tails because so much stuff is going to internet technology and internet purchasing. You think of an Amazon, and that's fine. But there are a bunch of brick and mortar stores out there and buildings out there, and there will always be there, and there will always be an Amazon, and there'll be somebody that will overtake Amazon one of these days. But there'll always be a need for brick and mortar stores for people to shop. And no, we, we're not a keystone. We don't want to be a keystone. We want to be a nice, clean town that invites development, invites families. You know, we, we started down that road with the, the, the uh, walking path program. I think that's a great step in the right direction, not to play on words. Um, but, you know, we started trying to improve our quality of life. And I think we're taking a step back. I'll agree. I'll get off my soapbox. That's all I have for Veterans Way. Okay. Any questions of me? I can't think of any. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, thank you. Next item on the agenda, analysis from Humboldt and Associates. Mr. Semler, would you please make a presentation? Thank you, Mr. President, members of the board. You know, my name is Jason Semler from Humboldt. It's been a few years, I think, since I've been in front of you. Uh, but we have uh, been helping the uh, clerk charges office uh, submit some of your annual information that's required at the LGF on the gateway over the years. And the mayor asked us to put together a report it kind of uh, updates uh, the TIF projection and compares that to the, the bonds that you have outstanding. Uh, the mayor asked me to come before you to present that report as well, so that's why I'm here tonight. So each one of you have a report, and we do this for well, probably about 45 to 50 of our clients uh, each year, put together a report kind of looking at last year's TIF, comparing it to what we'd estimated, uh, looking at projections going forward, and uh, comparing that to any bonds that you have outstanding. Uh, but I also put together some information that uh, hopefully you can use this as kind of a resource uh, for other projects uh, that come your way. And I kind of want to go through this real quickly. If you have any questions as we go through it, don't hesitate to stop me. I'd be, be glad to ask or answer those questions. Uh, but on page one, sir, on page one, I did put together uh, some historical information. Uh, at the top of page one, it talks about the bond, just a little bit about the bonds uh, that you did issue in 2014 uh, regarding uh, veterans uh, way. Uh, then below that, I put just a couple paragraphs about the background information uh, when the original area was created uh, in 2000, and uh, telling the, the area, the original area ends 30 years from that, 2030, and then also the expansion area that uh, you did in 2006, and it also has a 30-year life, ends in 2036. So that's just some information that um, hopefully you might find useful as you're looking at other projects. It's always kind of good to, to know when the area ends. Uh, so I put that in there for you. But starting on page two, uh, looks at the, the numbers. So I looked at 2016 last year and then also 2017. So the first number there, the net assessed value in the original area was $26.3 million. Take that times the tax increment. Uh, would have collected about $639,000 last year is what we've estimated. Uh, this year, uh, in the original area, the assessed value has uh, turned it up a little bit. But the tax rate has gone down, which is a good thing for the taxpayers, good thing for the municipality. Um, but because of the reduction in tax rate going from $2.52 to $2.37, did you see there? The tax increment from the original area is actually going to go down a little bit to $627,000 over estimated for this year. Page three looks at the expansion area that you did in 2006. Uh, there are a couple of uh, properties that are receiving abatements in that area. But you can see in 2016, uh, the unabated property plus the abated value, you can see it's about $20.3 million, less the $5.4 million base, what was already there. Uh, for 16, you captured about $14.8 million of assessed value. Take that times the tax rate, um, less circuit breaker, 
uh, you collect about $341,000 is what we estimated. Uh, so if you look at 16, for the original area, the expansion area, if you add those two together, I don't have it shown here, that's about $990,000, $980,000. You actually collected a little over a million dollars. Um, but that tells me, and you've kind of had a history of some delinquent taxpayers over the years, that tells me those delinquencies, they've actually paid up with interest. Uh, so you kind of got caught up, so that's a good thing. Uh, in 17, uh, you can see the tax increments anticipated to increase slightly to 358000 and then continue to increase uh, to $384,000 as those existing abatements uh, roll off. So these numbers don't assume any new development, any growth. This is just what's exactly there right now in paying taxes. Page four looks at the uh, repayment of the bonds uh, that were issued in 2014. About $9.5 million uh, were issued, but they were issued as draw bonds um, because you knew that the project was going to take some time to develop, so you're just drawing down principal as you need. And as of April, when we put this together, you'd drawn down about $2 million, just a little over $2 million. Uh, that left about $6.7 million that could be remaining, remaining to be drawn down over time. So we put together some rough estimates of the estimated draws um, over the next year and a half what those draws might be, uh, just to kind of give you an illustration. So to kind of look at the far right column, uh, that's kind of what the annual payment uh, would be. So the first couple of years are kind of be estimates, so all the amounts drawn down that you needed. Then after that, we'll have the final amount drawn down, the final amortization will be, will be calculated. As you can see the far right side, it's about $740,000 a year is what the annual payment is. And one thing, uh, uh, I do want to point out uh, one of the agreements or negotiation points that we did with the, the bank that purchased the bonds is all the principal need to be drawn down by August 2019. So that's kind of a key date to keep in mind. And then that's what we assumed here. So you assume the extra three and a half million dollar drawdown, that's with the, the final number on the right is with the three and a half yes. million dollar drawdown if yes. you're down that much. Yeah. yeah, we assume that you draw down the entire amount. And you really have 6.7 remaining to be drawn down. Yeah. You just kind of staggered that over the next year and a half. Right. Two years. So page five compares the tax increment uh, from the uh, allocation area uh, to the debt service payments, the principal and interest payments. So in 2017, you should collect $986,000 in tax increment from both the original area and the expansion area. Um, Subtract out the $503,000 of estimated debt service, estimated principal and interest that you'll pay. That'll leave you about $480,000 remaining at the end of this year to help fund your other projects uh, that you can consider. So you can kind of see from second to the column on the right what that estimated tax is remaining each, each year. So this is what you can use to help, hopefully, project other projects that you have in your plan and as they come up. Uh, but overall, uh, the tax increment, uh, I guess the next schedule, page six, this kind of shows you how the tax increment has grown since 2011. In 2011, just a, a little bit under $700,000, and it's grown to over a million dollars now. A lot of that has to do with the new development and the tax abatements rolling on. And then page seven, just what your account balance was in your allocation account as of May. And the reason that Baird's Way account, uh, don't be scared, that's one dollar, but as you probably know, you just draw down as you need it yeah. and then pay it out, which is very smart because then you're paying as little interest as possible. So overall, uh, you know, the tip area is doing very well, you know, more than enough to cover your cover your bonds, which is what you want, so you can, you can do other projects and serving or benefiting your area. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. So I want to, uh, I do have a question. Maybe I'm looking at this incorrectly, so hopefully you can help me out. Sure. So as of right now, with no growth, no more additional uh, tax increment out there at all, nothing else coming in, as a base over the 2033, the end of it, we'd be looking at a little over $5 million right now is the projected amount that we would have to spend for additional projects, plus I guess a three and a half million that we haven't drawn down yet. If we're looking at total amount that we're looking to draw down and spend, we'd be 
to drop eight and a half million. Or well, you haven't drawn down six million. Six yeah, that, that three point five million is just like the last draw. Okay. But you haven't drawn down six million. Okay. But yeah, you're correct. You can still draw down another six million at the bonds, and then have five million five. remaining. Yeah. Over the life of the tip area. Right. Okay. Just want to make sure it's right. Discussion of project list. Adam, could I ask you to talk about that? Yes. So we met Monday night. Jody, myself, Ron, and the mayor uh, met to go over the current project list to kind of see where we're at. I put a copy on everyone's table there. You'll see that obviously we're working on finishing Veterans Way Phase 2. Uh, we've done the first of the three years of the Greensburg School Request, which obviously we'll look at each year. Uh, the third part is finishing Lincoln Street. We talked about this last month from 1st of Maine, the Walnut to Maine. I think it's, it says 1st of Maine, but it should be Walnut to Maine after I think we right. had there. Mm -hmm. has an approximate cost of a million dollars. I'm going to stop there for a second, grab Ron. I think he has some new information about that before we go forward. To refresh your memory a little bit, uh, the city's community crossing matching grant program from 2016 included uh, a mill and overlay of Lincoln Street from Walnut to Main Street. Um, and then we started talking about doing more than just the pavement. So we have taken the mill and overlay out of the 2016 matching grant program and we are going to let me back up just a little bit uh, the matching grant program for us is that we can apply for up to a million dollars of state funds provided we match with a million dollars of city funding the city believes that we can get together about a half million and therefore apply for another half million to be used throughout the city like we did with what's just now being finished up. That would leave potentially another half million of state funding there and so we believe that the most prudent use of funds would be to create a community crossing matching grant project for reconstruction of the south end of Lincoln Street if you will provide the funding for the match. So instead of you spending a million dollars, um, hopefully you can spend a half million and the state will pay the other half million. Now, that money may be used for pavement, for drainage, for sidewalks, for curbs. It may be used for sidewalks and curbs as a part of a road project, not, not, only. not only by themselves that money cannot be used for the streetlights. So you would have to pay 100% of the streetlights. But it's a way, I believe, to leverage your money much further. So this is different. We have three years of this, correct? We can do this for the next three years, half a million dollars each year. With the, well, right now, I'm not sure I understand your question. So when we talked about initially, you were talking about how we can do this for the next three years, possibly the apply for a half million each year out of this. The original community crossing program was set up, I think, for three years, Mark. We're in the 17 will be the second year of that three-year life. However, with what the legislature did this spring and late winter in terms of highway funding, that did. 1002 changed the three year aspect of it. No. Okay. I really try to outthink what our legislature is always dangerous, but I think it'll be around for a while. Okay. But not guaranteed. But we got this year and we got next year for sure. As far as us putting money from the tip money into another general pot, is that something I know you said that there was something that changed where we 
thought we could do that, Ron. Have, have you talked to Mr. Tebby about this to see if this is something that we're allowed to do before we stop our current process? We, Chris and I have not talked about this. Uh, in 16, the money had to come from certain places. There was a special distribution of Lowett. There was rainy day money, and there was what are the vehicle? Oh, I'm sorry, they increased, increased uh, wheel tax money. The legislature changed that and with the new legislation and I believe now it's any highway any money designated any money, for highways. Any, yes, money designated for highways along with the rainy days and things like yeah. that. You can appropriate it from anything for highways and use it. So if you designate the money, you think that's gonna work? Are we going to Will we need to get an outside engineering firm to help us with the design, or is that something you will be able to do? We're right now thinking that we're going to do this in-house. Uh, the grants have to be applied for by the 15th, 14th of July, but our goal, because the mayor told us it was, is to have them in by the 1st of July. Um, and then we do not have to have final plans at that time. We need a good estimate. So that's what we'll be working on this coming week to fine tune that estimate. We do have to have that work under contract by April the 15th, I think it is, of 2018. So we have summer and fall and winter to get our plans finished and, and bid it and get it under contract. Yes, sir. And that's a season's mm -hmm. worth of work. So it could be constructed next summer, the summer of 18. So, Ron, is, are there, if we, if we do the matching grant, does that change, and we're trying to do it in house, does that change the requirements of what we do, how we construct it, et cetera? We've talked about that in some other projects. It's not like Veterans Way in that we have NDOT and Federal Highway oversight. Um, but there are um, accepted industry standards, for want of a better way to say it, that we will conform to because we will not, uh, certainly if I certify the work, I won't accept the liability of doing something that's not appropriate. And the city doesn't need that liability either. So uh, will we save money every place we can? Will we compromise the quality of what we're doing? No. We don't want to be something that down the line. And Dr. Waco and I talked about this a little bit. If her name's on it, we want it to be done right. Like it's not perfectly construed. Um, so good. And yeah, we want the south end looking like the north end. Like it's all good. And that's the general, um, that's my general expectation that we will carry for. The street lights will probably be the largest single definer of that continuity. And we intend to use those same fixtures and perpetuate them in the same fashion. And, um, the spacing might change a little bit as we get into the more residential neighborhood. We probably don't want quite as much light because lights both good and bad. Um, I mean, there's a pairs here, but you're saying the fixtures themselves would have to buy. <clears throat> Can we use that combined grant money, the matching money, to lay the, the wiring, etc.? cetera? So the whole, the whole what, electrification portion. What will happen is when we get to the contract point, uh, well, it's what the highway industry is commonly referred to as a Z item. That's an item that's not funded by certain kinds of money that we will designate certain pay items in the contract that will be have to be carefully accounted for and that money will have to come directly from you. So the controller, the wiring, the conduit, the light poles, the, the light fixtures themselves, 
those items will not be eligible for funding. The system, the, the complete system, will not be eligible for that money. We can still put them in the project, we can put them in the contract. We'll just have to account for them separately so that we can assure the state we didn't spend their money on that part of it. It's more of an accounting process than anything. I think it, I mean, if we can move forward with that and, and are fortunate enough to get that matching grant and start on it next, beginning of next year and have it finished next year, I think that would be awesome. I mean, it would be, we kind of stopped Lincoln Street where it made sense to, to stop the reconstruction, but it just to finish that on down, just to add. So if I could jump to number 11, the Ireland Street Extension. Um, if you could, Mr. May, speak about this, because this is obviously something the bottom of the list, but this is a long-term project. That project is high dollar and long-term. And for that to ever come to fruition, we'll likely need assistance, financial assistance from other sources. And the logical <coughs> one, I really think that is probably a 10-year process. It's a major project. Um, there's a lot of communities wanting railroad grade separation structures, bridges over the railroads. That's what we're talking about. I continue to chat with consultants when they stop in to uh, visit and say, hey, what do you think about this? And, one of the recommendations that I got in those conversations, and I think is really a good recommendation, that was that we conduct a feasibility study. And that feasibility study, um, we're talking about connecting the two pieces of Ireland Street here, and that is how it's in your plan. But a good feasibility study would really look at getting us a bridge over the railroad might not be at our own street. Now, I've looked at the city and, and thought about where could it work and would make sense, and that's the location that I always come back to. That's one. But in a feasibility study, we probably would want to ask our consultant to look at the city and think about are there other places that make more sense. One of the concerns that I have about our own street is there's only so much room for Main Street key it could go a little south of the key because it's ours and we can make all that in work but Main Street being the highway at all in the intersection with another highway it's going to be harder so the first part of the feasibility study will be to evaluate physically will fit can you get enough change in grade and satisfy all the design criteria in doing that and then the other part is to get a realistic number on the cost a project like this. One of the thoughts that was shared with me by one of the consultants is that when we go to NDOT and ask for assistance with federal monies, NDOT historically has looked very favorably upon communities that have done their homework, i.e. a feasibility study, and said, hey, we've looked at this, and this is the You've, you've thought about it, and this is a real thing, and, and you've got a chance. So that's the other benefit. Not only do we have much, much better information, but hopefully it will also be a sales tool in seeking further funds. So I, I talked with Adam and Jody the other night. I've talked with Ken a little bit about this also. Uh, I, I've been encouraged by at least those three not to put words in their mouth. Um, but I. I recommend to you that we go and buy proposals from appropriate consulting firms for this feasibility study and look at those proposals and decide if it's something that you all want to get involved with. Um, but without, it, 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 we just have to start and, and move forward and either at some point we abandon it or we just keep going until we get there. So if you don't tell me no, I'm probably going to do that. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Now this is 
given the fact that we've got a pretty significant list of some new projects and we just did see what our cash flow is going to be. I understand that it's a 10-year thing and I understand that um, you know the Federal Highway likes it when you're prepared but the thought process behind I mean, what's the driving force behind wanting to have it is it just for the fire protection and emergency vehicles to be able to cross I mean but because I'm just trying to figure out what the driving force behind needing this is. The community is bisected by the river. Absolutely, get that. And in the last few years, I believe we have seen continued increased rail traffic. Absolutely. And Honda has brought in another line of vehicles, and Honda, I, I think, believes they're going to grow, and I think most people believe they're going to grow, and that all points towards additional rail traffic and additional disruption. And when there's a train going through town, um, it there, creates a huge bottleneck. There's often no unoccupied crossing between Washington Street and what's the last one? Randall Street Wilder. or Wilder Street. Um, <clears throat> and while we now are fortunate enough to have the second fire station on the south side and have um, first responders station there if someone needs to get to the hospital from the south side they simply cannot while there's a train occupying the crossings um, that doesn't even speak to the disruption of the general public trying to move sort north south through the community while there's a train on the crossing um, those are the issues that truly motivate me for thinking this is something that the city needs. Well, I do see that there's probably going to be increased flow of rail coming through, um, and um, but it is a huge project, it is. and it's a big expense. And I just feel like there's a lot of other things that, though that absolutely has a direct impact on the public's health and safety. So I have mixed feelings. Any idea about a rough cost for a feasibility study? Twenty thousand dollars, fifty thousand dollars, hundred thousand dollars. The number that was thrown out by <coughs> the one consultant suggested it was forty. Forty thousand. Forty. So, if we put feelers out there, we could ask for if people are interested in what they might charge us for a feasibility study before we even decide to yes. do such. Okay. And well. That's Obviously, we're, no one's going to enter into a contract without a dollar amount. Right. So, um, it's important that we do quality-based selection, meaning not fee-based selection. Uh, I can tell you as a former consultant that if you want to pay me less, I can, I can satisfy all the rules, but I will do less for you. Um, having said that, money is always important. Nobody ever deserves a blank check. So, uh, I've thought a little about this. Maybe we ask for proposals for services and ask that they submit a proposed fee in a separate envelope so that we can look at what they tell well, you us. You can just negotiate it out yeah. once you select who you There's think different would ways be the to best. Get there. Um, but I'm hopeful that if our consultant floated out the idea of 40, that they were confident that was a good number or a little bit high because that's what I always try to do uh, but we could change the game on them a little bit too that's the other thing there's been no definition of services here we just said feasibility study so as we start to tighten that up a little bit that number could move around to some. this being a long-term project like you said 10 years I don't think it makes if we want to address this and it's high dollar I think we'd be smart to See if we can find an engineering firm to do a feasibility study for us. And geez, it's going to be three hundred million dollars. Well, we can't afford that, so yeah. we'll drop it off our right. Um, or well, that's within our financial wherewithal. So I think at the moment, uh, I keep talking about federal money. The state actually changed those rules a little bit, where the state's now keeping all the federal funds and giving local community state funds. 
but I, I'm, that would still be confident 80-20, where if it's a $10 million bridge, the state would put $8 million and we would put in $2 million kind of a thing. So, um, and I just picked that number because um, the math was really easy. Um, but the point is, we probably couldn't afford a $10 million project, but we might be able to come up with two. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's worth working the system and waiting to get there. I think it's good as well, these numbers next to the actual projects mean nothing. I think it, as a project board right now, we're trying to figure out the cost of everything. Mm -hmm. um, so we certainly don't want to say, let's take this project on and have no idea the approximate cost of it. So I think at this point, we're looking at it as, hey, what are the individual costs and what do we want to do next? So we can do it as a group, decide what to do next. So we're sitting here thinking, we should probably put some approximate numbers in that situation. So do, we, uh, do we need to? pass a motion to authorize Ron, but, or do we not even need to form a motion? To not be a good idea to have a motion. Yeah. I'd entertain a motion to... I have a, I have a question of you okay. before we get to that point. Um, it probably doesn't really matter with the request, but I'm thinking about who the contracting entity might be. Would it be you? Or would you be the fiducial agent? Would it be the Board of Works that would contract for the service? Um, the only reason I thought about it now is it might affect who I asked the proposals be addressed and delivered to. With Veterans Way Phase 2, you are the fiducial agent and the Board of Works is the contract. But we were the ones that took the solicitation. Yeah. Our group was the one that did the solicitation and selected who we thought, and then that was made a recommendation to the board. I think we should do it the same way. Yeah. Since we're the fiduciary. And then they did the contracting. Yeah. I think we should take the bids and they, they select the contract. So I'll make a motion that we accept bids for a feasibility study. Proposals. Proposals. Sorry. Proposal for Ireland Street extension with the bridge. And I second that. Thank you, Ken. Any other discussion? Uh, uh, Ron, I think we, I don't I think we should just be looking at Ireland. I think they need the feasible study should look at the whole area. Right. And not just that area. I mean, that's what our our thoughts are. If it doesn't but, happen but to it doesn't be Ireland, you might have to change your list later, but yeah. there ought to be plenty of right. time to but I just, you know, I think where it the, makes sense. The, where, yeah, the feasible studies should show where it should go, yeah. and not yes, just absolutely. well. This is where we're going to go with it. That's so the whole point so, of the feasibility yeah. study is not to predetermine. Yeah. So, but I just kind of wanted to make sure that we did. Do you want that in motion? Uh, yeah, that's fine. It's just or yeah. yeah. Do yeah. the motion so just nice. that we do the feasibility study to access. Yeah. See if it's possible. Yeah. 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 We'll second that. Second. 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 And it was before we had the Honda train situation really going on uh, about the concern of access to the south, south side of town because of the railroad tracks. It was discussed briefly at council and it was never pursued. And, and I sit here thinking, you know, if we had had the foresight back then, and I was there, so I'll put it on me too, um, and started to pursue this back then, we'd be eight years down the line. My lack of stuff foresight in that case annoys me. So we have a motion on the floor. Those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed. Motion carries three to zero. Thank you, Ron. Appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. I'll jump to uh, four. Probably the last one we talked about tonight: the recreation of Rebecca Park, quality of life. At this point, um, I think we'll move it to next month. I think we have a. Uh, some ideas from the mayor, the project board, and 
other entity here in town of, of what we can do out there for Rebecca Park. I think we'll have more information to be able to present next month uh, for that project and hopefully be able to move, move through that project fairly quickly. That is all the updates I have on the project list. Okay. So any questions? Any questions for us on the project list? Thanks. Thank you. Yep. Next item on the agenda, approval of claims. I think we have three claims. One from Rundell Ernstberger for $3,400. One from American Structure Point for $3,395.50. And then a, a formal voucher from the Greensburg Schools for the $150,000. And I handed this all up somewhere, and it was about $156,000. I'll make a motion that we pay our clients. Second. Thank you, Adam. Thank you. Ken, we have a motion made and seconded. Those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? Motion carries three to zero. I'm sorry to back up, but if I may, I'd like to. You may. The community crossing matching grant application requires a letter of financial commitment. Um, did you make a motion on this change to the funding? No, we did not make a motion. You may care to make a motion and authorize David to sign the financial commitment letter for the Lincoln Street CCMG project. I will make a motion that uh, David's allowed to sign for the CCG. Does your motion include that you will fund the South Lincoln Street portion of the CMG? Yes. Okay. I will second that. We have a motion made and seconded. Any discussion? Those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries three, three to zero. Thank you. We'll get that to you when it's together. Okay. Looks like that takes us pretty well to the end of our agenda. Our next meeting will be Thursday, July 20th, 2017 at 6.30 here. Any other comments? If not, we'll stand adjourned.